After decades of war, conflict and instability, Kashmir remains one of the world's most dangerous flashpoints and a highly sensitive topic here in India. The government says more than 40,000 people have died in the last 20 years. Human rights groups put the figure much higher. But did India do all it could to minimize casualties? Did it heed the concerns and suffering of the Kashmiri people? How many of the accusations against it are simply hostile propaganda? I'm the outsider. This is our motion tonight. India should be ashamed of its record in Kashmir. Well, speaking for that motion, Vrinda Grover, lawyer in the Delhi High Court and human rights activist. And with her, Junaid Matu, Srinagar District President of the Jammu and Kashmir People's Conference, who writes widely on the issues of the state. Against the motion, General B.S. Jaswal, former Northern Army Commander in the Indian Armed Forces. And with him, Wajahat Habibullah, Chairman of the National Commission for Minorities. He has served in a number of official roles in Jammu and Kashmir, including as Divisional Commissioner Kashmir. Ladies and gentlemen, our panel. <laughs> so could I first ask Brinda Grover to speak for the motion, please? Sure. As a constitutional democracy, India is obliged to protect the fundamental rights guaranteed in its constitution and the human rights in international covenants to which it is a party, like the ICCPR. Foremost among this is the protection of the right to life and personal liberty against arbitrary deprivation. Also, the enjoyment of fundamental freedoms, including the freedom to express one's political opinion or aspirations and the right to assemble and protest democratically. The labyrinth of laws, institutions, and security apparatus that operate in Kashmir create the conditions for human rights violations. And these include illegal detention and arrest, torture, extrajudicial execution, sexual violence, and enforced disappearances. It must be understood that these violations are neither incidental nor accidental, but are a consequence of the militarization and the attendant impunity in the valley. India has maintained that there is no armed conflict in the country. And yet, because of the troops stationed there, it is perhaps the highest militarized zone in the world. What is at peril is the daily life of the people and the right to life, which cannot be derogated from both under national and international law, even in times of an emergency. About 68,000 people are said to have died in the conflict. Over 8,000 people have disappeared. The list of those tortured and injured is too long to enumerate over here. The matrix of special laws under which the armed forces operate in the valley, such as the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, sanctions the arbitrary use of excessive power, including the right to shoot to kill, to arrest and detain without warrant, to search and seize without warrant, to destroy property, all on mere suspicion. What makes the impunity rampant is that the law prevents and makes them immune from any prosecution. Could you wrap up, please? Yes. Data shows that not a single person has been prosecuted for uh, human rights violations in Kashmir. The morale of troops trumps the human rights of the people of Kashmir. India's hum uh, human rights please. violations there make it vulnerable to the charge of crimes against humanity. I must ask you to stop. Brinda Grover, thank you very much indeed. You say that uh, very little has been done in the way of justice. Um, in March this year, the state government announced that more than 400 cases had been launched against security forces personnel in the past three years alone. This was a written response to the Jammu and Kashmir Assembly. So I don't know where you're getting your information from, from but they're putting out very different information. Of those 444 cases, almost 300 have appeared in local courts. May I respond with an information from the Ministry of Defense, an RTI application filed by me asking how many security personnel has been sanctioned for prosecution for human rights violations in Kashmir between 1989 and uh, 2011. The answer, this is a document from the Ministry of Defense. They received 44 applications for sanction for prosecution. They have rejected 33 applications, 11 applications are pending consideration. Please do the maths. It says nil sanction for prosecution granted for so, any. So, so what is the Jammu and Kashmir Assembly talking about then? They're talking about cases that have been initiated, not prosecuted. And you've now had the Central Bureau of Investigation brought in as well? 
yes. on the auspices of the Supreme Court, five soldiers accused of murder. The Supreme Court has also stepped in here, ordering the military to make up its mind where to have the case heard, either in civilian court or in military court. Well, so it's not true to say that nothing has been done. You're asking this audience to believe that India should be ashamed. Well, when bad things happen, if redress is carried out, why should they still be ashamed? When there was an interlocutor's report, they had a government panel, they appointed a government panel, they sent it there. They talked to 700 different delegations to find out what was wrong and what was the way forward. Should India be ashamed about that as well? The report of the interlocutors talks about truth and reconciliation. The missing concept is justice. Justice is integral to any conversation and solution in Kashmir. It talked about all the wrongs that they thought had been committed. But did not suggest justice as the remedy or the way forward. It talked about ending the, the indiscriminate use of the Public Safety Act, didn't it? Uh, those people who have committed the wrongs need to be made accountable. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court, in the Patribal case that you mentioned, the verdict gave the choice to the army. The army most predictably said, we will court-martial them. All right, Vrinder Grover, thank you very much indeed. Could I please ask General Jaswal to speak against the motion? Yeah, I, I uh, do not agree with the motion which has been set in over here. I think we should be proud of our actions in Jammu and Kashmir, despite the constraints we have, as a matter of fact, been able to bring the situation to near normalcy. I think the causes belly of this entire motion being set is a psychological dislocation which Pakistanis, the separatists and other inimical forces to India, they've been able to achieve, albeit falsely. They have systematically been paralyzing our entire endeavor in the state, whether it was political, whether economic, diplomatic or HR violation, I'll respond to Brinda later on. I mean, the exaggeration on human rights violation uh, has indeed had a seismic effect. Just to quote 1,500 plus cases, only 35, 2.32% have been proved right. If any persona who needs to be dubbed as a person who should be ashamed, it should be Pakistan and the separatists. True democracy is prevailing in the state. Where else do you find the separatists being permitted to voice their feelings openly, the print being free to voice anything out there, and the separatists even go outside and they have dialogue with our arch rivals, Pakistan. I would like to make a mention here of the armed forces because time and again, army comes into play. If there is a situation in JNK which is normal today, majority of the credit should go to the armed forces. Unfortunately, time and again, the army gets crucified on the altar of criticism, despite the sacrifices which they do out there. All right. General Jaswal, thank you very much indeed. What's, what's India got to hide in Kashmir? We have nothing to hide out there and... Uh, I, I ask you this because here's the latest edition of The Economist, which has uh, India in search of a dream on its cover. And when you open it up, the censor has put a black sticker what? over... It's not a cartoon. It's not a, anything insulting to India. It's a map of Kashmir. It's a map showing disputed territories. I will tell you, I'll tell you the background as to why this particular map, it basically... Does that show free speech? Is that something to be proud of? A big pun? Does that show free speech that you were talking about? Yeah, yeah. People free to say what they want and yes, show what yes, they yes. want. That shows it. No, that's upon an individual, the way he wants to project the whole thing. You approve of that? No, I don't approve of it. The state censor? No, because the territory probably in the map, what he's tried to show, it is basically in Siachen. Because instead of following the line from NJ9842, do northwards. He has shown well, it in should, an The point is, people should be able to show what they want. No, they Indians cannot. They cannot show. They cannot show. Oh, you show. can't show the wrong map. They cannot show a wrong map. It has to be blanked out. Oh, I see. Okay, so you're in favor of censorship. Um, General Jaswal, 
Why is it that uh, it takes a government-appointed panel to tell the army in Kashmir to stop intimidating and harassing citizens? No, this is a perception again. I think... Uh, this is what the interlocutors panel said. No, but they've not understood... They recommended the that there was a need to end the intimidation and harassment of citizens by the police, the paramilitary and the army. It's in their report, no, which was published earlier this year. I'll tell you, uh, what you're trying to say is that the mere presence of armed forces over there like she has said, the armored vehicles, etc., what are there? It's intimidation. But I would like to say, and well, I don't think the panel concluded that they, they are quite specific to end the intimidation and harassment no. of citizens. Why are the security forces still intimidating and harassing citizens? No, we are citizens? not intimidating. I will tell you, if in case. So how did the panel get it so wrong? They spoke to seven hundred. No, there's so many things wrong with the panel. Why? It was a government-appointed panel. Have they lauded the role of the army? It was a government-appointed panel. No, that's okay. They spoke to the army on many occasions. No, they have not. They didn't speak they, to the they army They did at go all? to 15 core, and the perspective which the army had given, that has not been brought out. So you say it's, nowhere, un it's unfair. Nowhere. It's unfair. So the list of wrongs that they talked about that the Kashmiris have suffered, which were rigged elections, the dismissal of elected governments and installation of pliant ones, the arrest of popular leaders, the choking of dissenting voices through harsh laws. You don't recognize any of those things. No, there are certain that, that, things. That India there are certain wrongs which is are responsible there. For. There are inadequacies over there, but that's in a system. It happens. So India shouldn't be ashamed of those things? No, there's no question of being ashamed about it. I think despite the adverse situation, if we have been able to bring back the situation from what it was in early 90s to a near state of normalcy now, I think why should we be ashamed of it? All right, General Jaswa, thank you very much indeed. Junaid Matu, could I ask you to speak for the motion, please? Uh, Tim, because uh, the motion at hand is so explicit in what it states, uh, I would start by stating that uh, the greatness of great nations lies in accepting its fragilities and its follies. And uh, I believe India is a great nation, and India has committed uh, its share of blunders in Kashmir. Uh, I think it's also very important to draw a distinction between the state of India and the people of India, the nation of India. It often happens that states, as is their habit, uh, have, have this way of uh, tutoring an entire nation about what to believe under the paranoia or construct of national, in, national interest or uh, national security. Uh, and Indians fit into the stereotype mold with relative ease. And I say this because the ordinary Indian has huge moral costs to bear when it comes to what the Indian military and the Indian paramilitary forces have been allowed to do in Kashmir. Putting this into perspective, uh, there is no doubt about the fact that Kashmiris uh, had this romantic concept, if I may, this aspiration of freedom. But how did the Indian state, again, when I say the Indian state, I mean the Indian governments and establishments that over the years have dealt with Kashmir. How did the Indian state respond to that romantic aspiration? The response was purely operational. The key word was conflict management. The response of the Indian state, its leadership in the uh, armed forces or the opinion makers was purely operational, managing the conflict rather than engaging, politically engaging with the people of Kashmir. And when you talk about operational mechanisms, you talk about sending the army into civilian areas and giving it uh, immunity under laws like the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, uh, the Disturbed Areas Act or the Public Safety Act. And when that happens, in the fight against combatants, non-combatants get sucked in. And that translates into huge human rights abuses, which have happened in Kashmir, which uh, nobody can deny. Uh, when you speak of uh, fake encounters, or when you speak of enforced disappearances, or when you speak of extrajudicial killings. Could you come to a close, please? Uh, there are numerous examples you can quote. <clears throat> and in quoting those examples, you can get lost into an array of statistics. But the debate at hand is, should India be ashamed of its role in Kashmir? As I said, I think uh, in this context, being ashamed of its role in Kashmir leads to the greatness, an exhibition of greatness. Okay. It, it's, it, it indicates a redress. And I, have I, to, think, I have to stop you. Uh, and I think that reconciliation is the only way forward, and for that, a redress needs to okay. be done. Okay, Junaid Matu, thank you very much indeed. Um, shame when the armed forces of this great nation have lost 5,000. 300 people fighting for a piece of sovereign India. You're really asking the audience to feel 
shame for the sacrifice that the armed forces have made. Tim, as much as my for heart, this country, as much as my heart goes out to every life that has been lost, that's a feature of war. Shame if a few bad apples overstepped the mark and that there were a few human rights abuses. I wouldn't term it as a few human rights abuses. I would term it as the failure of the constitutional duty of the state of India to uphold the constitutional rights and liberties of the people of Kashmir. But I, you were complaining about the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, but the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of that in 1998, didn't it? The Supreme Court, which has a record of protecting the underdogs in this society. Unfortunately, protecting the... protecting individuals. What I'm trying to say is that the system views Kashmir with a special focus. And when I say special, that has its advantages as well as its disadvantages. And Kashmiris, unfortunately, have seen the end of disadvantages in that context. When you say shame, and it is a big word, um, you're taking no account of the rehabilitation efforts that have been made, um, the attempts to scale down the security presence, uh, the government's promise to amend the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, and its constant emphasis on the fact that it will not tolerate human rights violations. This from the Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, also from the Defence Minister Antony. Well, Taking no account of those things as well. Rhetoric is, uh, is as old as uh, India's role in Kashmir, and I am taking account of Well, the of rhetoric it. is commitment, isn't it? To do something about it, if human rights violations have taken place. And I welcome those commitments. What I'm trying to say is that Kashmiris deserve a closure before they can move on and be a part of this society and system. And reconciliation is the only way forward. And for that to happen, I'm not saying that India needs to constantly say sorry to Kashmiris, keep saying sorry, and Kashmiris should keep expecting that this apology keeps coming. But there needs to be redressal and closure. And for that, right. an admission of failure needs to be done. Junaid Matu, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Wajahad Habibullah, would you speak, please, against the motion? Uh, first of all, may I say that, yes, I agree that certain things have happened in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, and unfortunately, I was part of that system which, of which we need to be ashamed. But should India be ashamed of its record in Jammu and Kashmir? Let me say that at the time that the state acceded to India, one matter was, uh, was, was accepted by India, for as, 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 as a part of the accession, and that was that the identity of Kashmir would be kept preserved. And we have done that. We've had a clause in our constitution which has survived all these years, Article 370. Now, those who are opposed will say that no, no, this, is, this, this article has been compromised and laws have been made uh, thereafter which have compromised this article. But then who made those laws? Those laws were all passed by the state government through assemblies elected by the people of the state. It was not something that was thrust in violation of Article 370 on the people of Jammu and Kashmir. And there were the big Partha Sarthi talks which resulted in the Farooq Indira Accord, which allowed the state government to review all those laws, which were passed, which were enforced on that state after 1953. And the state government was given the authority to actually rescind those laws which it actually felt were against the interests of the state. And I remember speaking to uh, Mirza Afzal Beg, who was at that time law minister of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. A committee was set up under Devi Das Thakur, a retired justice of the High Court of, De of Jammu and Kashmir. And Mr. Beg Saab said to me, Ab these are all laws. Do we not want the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in the state of JNK? Do we not want the Election Commission to be operative in JNK? So yes, and although I agree, there have been matters of which we need to be ashamed. But we must also recognize the state is now recovering from an insurgency. And, 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 and as, as, as the General said, also, uh, uh, also in a proxy war in that state, which has lasted for 20 years. The state is now recovering from it. And yes, I would certainly, give credit, close, I would certainly give credit to the people of Jammu and Kashmir that they have actually risen above that and renounced violence. Thank you very much indeed. I'm slightly surprised, I must say, to find you on this side of the motion. I, looking at page 130 of your book, My Kashmir, you say, even though the protection of human rights is institutionalized at both the state and national levels, this mechanism's effectiveness in ensuring that the public receives protection is questionable. Correct. 
questionable protection of human rights. Correct. That's and nothing to be proud of, is correct. it? Correct. And I, I agree that there are certain things of which we do not need to be proud. And that I'm, you, in fact, should be ashamed of. Also not just not yes. proud. Yes. That's it's, it's more than a red face, isn't it? But Tim, that is the question that I you put... You have more than a red yes, face. Tim, that's the question I put first, uh, first personally. I said that there are certain things of which we need to be ashamed. You say also reports of human rights violation were investigated by yeah. the civil authority and remedial action and sought, to be a but, civil but repression yeah. continued. That's true also. So the Indian state was responsible for repression there was. in Jammu and Kashmir. But let, let please put it in the context of what I said. The state, I mean, uh, and, and, the, and so you're saying the state has made amends for this? The state, I mean, yes, the state is seeking to make amends, and certainly with the help of the people of the state, we can set matters right. The matter is that the whole state was disrupted. Well, wouldn't over the first the last thing to, to do if you were going to set matters right would be to have some justice, wouldn't it? Correct. I mean, in 2010, Pavez Imroz, a lawyer who is uh, leading the Jammu and Kashmir coalition of civil society, said there were 458 cases from 1990 to 2006, 458 cases in which investigations had implicated security forces personnel. But permission for prosecution was not forthcoming. 458 my, cases. My dear Tim, I had explained to Pervez Rose, I was at the time chief information commissioner, I said human rights violation by the security forces can be investigated under orders of the chief information commissioner. Please come to me with your cases. Yeah, well, not it's not coming. One, it's one not case came before 458 me. cases, he said. So cites. one case came before me. It's all right to write. You may write 3,000 cases. But bring those cases before the authority who can remedy it. The UN Special Rapporteur who visited Kashmir in March this year said he was deeply concerned, along with the National Human Rights Commission, and in his reports, the special rapporteur quotes the National Human Rights Commission as saying, on occasion, extrajudicial executions have become virtually a part of state policy. Unfortunately, that has been the case. That is a terrible accusation, isn't it? That has been against the, case. the state. And also, I have also reported Extra on that. Extrajudicial executions. The, the first case... Virtually a part of state policy? The, the first case the National Human Rights Commission took cognizance of was a report made by me on the firing in Beach Bihara, which I just considered unjustified and unjustifiable. Again, these are So incidents. nothing can justify that, extrajudicial executions? Not. They cannot be justified. So there's no return from a position of shame then? No, a position of shame for that, for these extrajudicial killings. But should the Indian state be shamed? Also, if I may say, I was part of that system. Are you shocked Here, by this? Are you shocked by this? But my dear Tim, let me explain. The point is that as part of that Indian state, I was within the government protesting against such things happening. Right. So the Indian state doesn't have to be. The st Indian state within itself you, you, you contained took, the You mechanism. took the shame for them. All right. Well, okay, I was ready to take Wajahad the shame. Wajahat Habibullah. I, I nearly got, got my life lost in Wajahad the Wajahat Habibullah. Thank you very much indeed. All right, okay, we're going to take a break. When we come back, a question to the audience. Is Kashmir still worth fighting for? Join us in a moment. <laughs>